Good to have you all here today. Good to be here. Nice to be here. Yes, and it's wonderful to see you, Joe. <laughs> Got a pair of butchers over here. <laughs> now, Butch Ritter, of course, it's good to have you here. I'm glad you're feeling better. And then, Butch, I don't remember what your last name is. Teasel. Okay. Are you Wyoming County? Uh, no, I'm Bradford. Bradford County? Yeah. Okay, Butch is a friend of uh, Barb's over here, but we met him uh, at the church picnic and uh, at Barb's birthday party, actually. And so it's a pleasure to have you here with us again today. Thank you. Yep. Glad to have everybody else here today. Hope you all had uh, brought your winter coats. <laughs> this morning it was about 6.30 and it, there was the lightest mist in the air, but in the light it looked like snow. Just mist. Well, let's see what we have here today. Sunday school is recessed till next Sunday. Choir rehearsal is recessed till next Sunday. And after ch church, there is a covered dish dinner table. If you forgot about it and didn't bring something, please stay, you're more than welcome. There's more than enough to eat down there, it's always good. And uh, you're just more than welcome. Uh, let's see here. Ladies meeting to be announced. All right, great to have you all here today. Let's turn our hymnals to 256. Now here's the way this is going to work. 
uh, this is the first week with this new one, the men will read the first line, and then even though it's not italicized, the women will read the next line. Then we'll go to the next doublet, and the men will read the first line, and the women will read the second. And on we'll go. Yeah. Shall we try it? Right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own insight. And all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh. And refreshing to your bones. Honor the Lord with your substance. And with the first fruits of all your produce. And then your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves. And the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. Thank you. May be seated. Let's bow our heads, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. Our Heavenly Father, what a great thing it is to call you Father. We could wander around in this world and not really know who you are or what you're like. We could look at this creation and say, wow, it's, this is a, absolutely awesome this grandest stage that could ever be the world the universe and have an inkling that there's got to be a creator behind it we could reason that and there has to be a grand and unbelievable mind and creative power to bring forth what is but we have so much more than just our reasoning we have so much more than just our assumptions because you have revealed yourself to us, you have made yourself known. And you've told us that we ought to call you our Heavenly Father. And you've told us about your Son, who came into this world, that he might die on our behalf, that our sins might be wiped away, that we might be set free, made clean, in fact, made holy and acceptable in the very presence of God. There's no way we could know this if you haven't revealed these things to us but you have, and we're grateful. We ask you to continue to speak to us. We pray that you'd give us a deep understanding of who you are, how good and gracious you are, what your priorities are, what your values are, the things that you think are important, and that we might make those our own. We pray, Father, that you'd come upon us today again in power and open our hearts and minds and eyes to see the things as you see them. We also thank you, Lord, that you have told us that you hear our prayers. You said it explicitly. And our Heavenly Father, we come before you today on behalf of many of our friends and family. And once again, Lord, we want to especially single out Betsy Warmoth. Now, Lord, she's going to... We're grateful she was able to get the chemo and radiation. We're also very grateful that it's done. We know how harsh and difficult that treatment is, and that the treatment itself recovered or requires a great recovery. So, Father, we ask you to put your hand upon her again. Continue to heal her body, heal her soul, heal her mind and her spirit. We pray, Father, that you would encourage her from deep within in a way that no man, woman, or child could ever do. We pray, Father, that she might get good numbers, and we pray that her appetite might return very rapidly. And that she might not only be able to eat, but want to eat. And so, our Father, we ask you to put that upon her and help her as she recovers. Return her to homeostasis and normality. We pray for all those on our prayer list. We're praying for Carol Johnson today. And again, Lord, we ask you to put your hand on her. And, Lord, we don't know. You know, these, these things are beyond us. That's why we go to doctors again and again, and we get opinions and solutions, and yet problems continue. Because, Father, we are a very needy and a very weak people. But you are our God, and we ask you to help, Carol. 
Put your hand upon her and give her the strength she needs. Lord, whatever the solution may be, wherever it is or whatever it needs to be done, we pray that you bring it to pass. We pray that for all our friends and family here on this prayer list, Lord. Our humble prayer is that each and every one might rise up one day and say, the Lord is my healer. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that these folk might live their lives out with their friends and family and enjoy their fellowship and comfort and enjoy fellowship with you for the rest of their days in this world. We ask you for wisdom and guidance and understanding that we all as a people might make the right and good choices. And that when we assess our lives and see things in our lives that really are not helpful, that we might have the courage, the faith, and the inspiration to actually do something about it. Our Heavenly Father, put your hand upon each and every one here today. We pray for our friend Francisco uh, Moran down there in the Dominican Republic. And we're grateful for the work that's going on down there. In fact, they are getting ready to host the, uh, the World Primitive Methodist Conference uh, next May. And so as they anticipate that, Lord, we ask your blessing upon these good folk down there. We're thinking of our friend Fernando Gomez, Gomez up there in Massachusetts. We ask your blessing upon him. We pray that you speak to hearts and souls and uh, use that as a lighthouse in that community. We're also praying for our buddy Bill Harlock over in New Jersey. And our Heavenly Father, again, we ask you to encourage him daily. We pray that your spirit might be upon him, that you would give him encouragement and guidance. And we pray that for all our seniors, Lord. Please help them in a very special way, and we'll be so grateful. Father, we can pray all day to be a worthy enterprise. This world needs great prayer. Uh, there are wars and rumors of wars, and uh, there are really always have been. We don't always know about them. They don't catch the interest of the right people. But we understand certain things are going on now. We pray, Father, first and foremost, for the peace of Israel. We pray that you put your hand upon these people. They've suffered double for their sin. And our Heavenly Father, uh, they're us. So we ask you to continue to watch over these folk and take care of them. We pray that you bring peace to that region. We pray that you raise up people who are able to do that kind of negotiation and bring that kind of civility. And uh, we pray for that all over the world. Our Heavenly Father, we could pray forever and it'd be over the enterprise. We're gonna leave our specific public prayers at this. We're going to ask you to hear all our prayers. Hear our heart as we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, Glory forever. Amen. Okay, folks. You can follow along by turning your bulletin over and looking where it says at the top of the page, uh, do not lay up treasures. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. We continue our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Father, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. And our Father, thank you so much for your holy word. Again, you have not left us as orphans down here in this world. Number one, you speak to us through this great creation. The heavens, the earth, the fullness of it, it declares your glory every day. There's not a tongue, there's not a language, there's no man, woman, or child on anywhere on the planet Earth who can't see that there is a great God who has created a magnificent thing. And our Heavenly Father, you have spoken to us through prophets and apostles who, like Moses, you met face to face. Daniel, you spoke to him through dreams and visions. King David, you spoke to through priests and prophets. 
and you speak to us through them. And the apostles have carried the message of the crucified and risen Christ to the far ends of the earth, and they gave their life to do it. We have your holy word written now in scripture. For the things that have been recorded and preserved are all instructive, they're all worthy of guidance, they're all worthy of our attention. They show us, they pave the way for us to walk into eternity with you. And certainly not least, you have poured out your Holy Spirit upon all flesh, as many as call upon the name of the Lord our God. And so our Father, we're not orphans down here at all, but we have your absolute presence dwelling in our souls. We have your words written before us. We have your people sitting around us. Please come and speak to us, and we'll be grateful forever in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Once again, where are we? Jesus has been born into this world. He grew up in his home with his brothers and sisters. He was led by God, specifically the Spirit of God, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we're told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus has been tempted in every way that we are yet without sin. That alone, a stunning and astounding uh, statement that Jesus has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And so the book of Hebrews tells us we have a great high priest who's not indifferent, who can't be touched with our needs and our wants and the things we experience in this world, he's gone through them all. And that Jesus, after being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, left and began to preach the gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the kingdom of God, as Moses said, you don't have to climb a ladder to heaven to get it. You didn't have to dig down in the earth and get down into the nether regions to find it. It's right before you. It's right at your hand. It's right in our presence. The Gospel of Luke would record Jesus as saying, the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven, God's presence itself, right here, right now, in human hearts. Jesus goes and preaches that Gospel, and then we find him going up on a mountain one day, and he sits on that rock. And he starts to teach and tell us, again, the things of heaven. Why did Jesus have such authority? Okay? Uh, go to buy a car, right? Car salesman rushes out to the parking lot and assaults you, I mean, uh, assists you <laughs> with, you know, what can I do for you today? And uh, we're looking around the parking lot. You might tell him what you want, or you might wish he'd just go away. Uh, but when you finally do have a question, like, uh, well, what would you give me for my car? He goes back in. And he talks to the manager, or he talks to the mechanics crew, and somebody else comes out, and they assess the vehicle, and then they go back to him, and then he comes back and says, okay, you know, here's what I'll do for you. He can't tell you what he'll do for you. And then when he comes out with a, okay, you know, you want this car, we're gonna sell you this car, here's the plan, uh, here's what's gonna cost you, here's what to give you for your car, here's what we'll sell this car for, here's what title, taxes, and all those other wonderful things, here's what they're gonna cost you. And then you say, you do any better than that? I mean, can we come a little lower on that car, or can you give me a little more on mine? Uh, that's, you're squeezing it there. What can you do? And he has to go back and talk to the manager, because he does not have authority. Get this. Jesus comes down from heaven to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to save us. He sits on a rock 
in the very presence, probably a thousand or more people. We know that when he fed the 5,000, there were thousands in his presence. For the Sermon on the Mount, we're not given any figures, but we have to assume there was a pretty good crowd there. And Jesus began to teach these people. And you know what they said? They said what they said back in the synagogue in his hometown. They said, we've never heard anything like this. This man speaks with authority. He doesn't have to run back up to heaven to find out. He doesn't have to go to his prayer closet and find out what God might reveal to him there. He doesn't have to check with a prophet. He doesn't have to go down to the temple and say to the priest, hey, I need to figure this out. And the priest with that, that vest that has the representation of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they figure out the will, excuse me, the will of God. But Jesus sits on a rock. And as God himself, speaks clearly and directly to us. What does God expect? What does God want? What will God do? What will God accept? What does God think about you? Well, let's take a look. We started out, we, he said, blessed are the poor. I mean, you've got to have a humble heart or you will never understand God. You'll never understand the kingdom of God. You, as Jesus said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means you got to change your mind. You got to change your attitude. You got to change the way you think. You can't just lock yourself into the source of this world's power, or the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world, we've been told from the first page of the Bible, is corrupt, is disjointed is separated from the will of God. It has a, an error in it. You ever get an error message on your computer? An error message on your TV? It's lovely, isn't it? Uh, error, and it's got a number on it. And so you call up, if you have the stomach to do it, uh, you call up for help. And the Indian voice comes over the line. <laughs> And you wish you could interpret tongues, but you can't. And you say, could you please speak up? And then they speak up, but they still have that second language thing. And they walk you through and tell you what you need to do. And once in a blue moon it works. But most often, you're gonna be on the phone for two or three hours. You may or may not get a solution. And at the end of it, the solution probably is, oh well, this computer shot, uh, I guess I gotta get another one, okay? An error message. There's an error in the human race. That's why we don't honor God. That's why we think that we don't wanna surrender our independence. That's why we have it on our head that we wanna be in control of our own lives and if we were to ever give control to God, he would make our lives so difficult. He would make our lives so hard. He would make our lives so restricted. We would never smile again. We'd never have joy. We'd never have peace. We'd never, because it's all religious and it's churchly and it's stained glass and it's tightrope walking and it's rules and laws and condemnation and shame and embarrassment just heaped upon us. And Jesus sits on the rock and says things like, come unto me, all you who labor in heaven. Are you about sick of that? Have you found out how empty religion really is? Have you found out that all the religions of the world will never ever get, including Judaism and including Christianity, will never get you where you need to go? You need a relationship with the Son of God Himself. You need to talk to the one, rely, relate to the one who has the authority of heaven and earth. And He'll put you in the right direction. He tells us the two great commandments are what? They're, all, they're, they're prefaced on love. They're based on love. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. If you have this spirit, if you have this attitude, 
that love is the controlling inspiration in my heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your might. In other words, let's break that down. Let's love the Lord our God as best as we know and understand how. Well, we can do that. Uh, to try and figure out a seven-step program, to how to love God, you can do that. Sometimes it's helpful. But what you really need to do is just fall in love with God. Look at his creation and appreciate it for how magnificent it is. And look at his creation and realize that it is sin. It is the violation of the will of God that brings slavery. It's the violation of the will of God. It's doing things in a way that my flesh craves. I want instant gratification. And I want it now. And if God can't offer it, I'll have to look somewhere else. I need it now. And you'll be a slave forever. Okay? God bless you. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. The root of all relationships. Put people first. I never forget, I said to Dad, I, I don't even know why I said it to him. But uh, I said, Dad, what's the most important thing in the world? Or something of that nature. And he said, people. And I thought, wow, that's pretty precious. And I walked away never forgetting it. Never. And, and then I start reading the Bible. And all I see is people. People. Not the Sabbath. But the people whom the Sabbath was given to help. Not religion, but the people to whom religion was given as a help, as an aid. People, love people. And you'll find your way to keep the commands of God and you'll experience the love of Christ. He says here in our passage today in the Sermon on the Mount, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. It's a bunch of interesting words in there. The word treasure. It's the word thesaurus. What is a thesaurus? Right? It's not a dictionary. But it's a book with a head word, and then it says all the words that are like it, and that are mean about the same thing. Or they're in the same kind of category. It's a treasure chest of words. That's what a thesaurus is. It's a treasure chest of words. And he says, don't lay up for your... And when I think of treasures too, uh, I think of the old pirate ship. And remember the treasure chest that was on every pirate ship, on every Popeye cartoon you ever watched? How many people grew up watching Popeye cartoons? <laughs> God bless you. That's the greatest generation right there. Popeye, Bluto, right? Spinach. Popeye's an enunciation of certain words. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. But there was always a treasure chest somewhere involved, right? And you remember what the treasure chest looked like? I mean, it was a box, but it wasn't just a box. A, a real treasure chest, the way they're supposed to be, like they were on the cartoons. They have a slightly tapered uh, sides that come down so the base of the box is a little bit smaller than the mouth of the box. So there's tapering there. <laughs> then remember the top of the box? It wasn't just a flat panel. A real treasure chest has to have a curve that goes up like this, comes down like a bell curve. If it doesn't have that, it's not a real treasure chest. And what's in the treasure chest? Remember, there used to be like gold doubloons, and there was jewels, and pearls, and things on chains that would have to hang out the side because there was so much good stuff in there. That's a human treasure chest. God says, you get yourself a treasure chest full of heavenly things. Don't lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can consume them where thieves break in and steal. 
That idea of breaking into steel, you know what the Greek says? Where thieves can dig through and steal. Because the idea is, in ancient days, a house, they were made of mud and brick. They were made of stone, mud, brick, and wood. And so the thief, he's not going to come through the front door. He's going around the back of the house, and he's just going to dig through the side of the house. Dig through the wall, that's how he gets in, that's how he steals. The things of this world are all subject to decay. They're subject to wear. They're subject to tear. Moths. Remember they used to have those moth balls? Yeah. Grandma's house. I don't know if you did. Yeah. If you were you allowed to have them in a regular house, they had to be at Grandma's house. All the time. A regular house. We weren't. We didn't have any mothballs around. They were fun to smell. I don't remember what the chemical was. But they were an interesting aroma that you know you didn't ordinarily have. Rumor had it that those mothballs would keep moths away from the wool clothing. Because if you didn't have the mothballs, all of a sudden you'd go to put your winter coat on and it would look like Swiss cheese. <laughs> so you need mothballs. Because the things of this world, they all perish. My buddy John over here, John Lutz, asked me every week, how's that Lincoln? He knows how much I love that Lincoln. Uh, MKZ, how's that Lincoln? I know you wanted one. I told you I wanted one since I was a kid, wanted a Lincoln. How's that Lincoln? <laughs> well, transfer case is full of paste. It's not fluid anymore. It turned to paste. And the uh, bearing on the front makes a horrible noise. So the whole thing makes sort of a grinding, scraping noise so that Beth says, I can hear you coming down Jefferson Avenue. <laughs> yeah, the Lincoln's no more. They wore out. You know, everything you have is ultimately going to wear out, no matter how important it is or what, how special it is to you. You got a special shotgun, right? Somebody gave it to you. You put it up on your shelf. You better keep taking care of it. You better keep oiling it. You better clean it regularly, even if you don't use it. Because sooner or later, that thing's going to turn to rust. And it's not going to be a treasure. And your grandkid is going to pick that doggone thing up one day and say, what a piece of junk this is, and he's going to throw it away. And when you got that thing, it was the greatest thing you'd ever have. But it's of no value now. Value now. And then your clothes. Clothes you wore when you were in high school that they were the coolest thing you could have. And now, thankfully, for fashion reasons, we don't wear those things anymore. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but that's where we're headed. I, that's what I love about this necktie. I got this doggone thing like 20 years ago, and it still fits. So, <laughs> what? One more time. A little shorter. A little shorter. <laughs> and that's how true. My grandmother, my grandmother was four foot ten when I was a kid. When she was done, she was four foot eight. I used to be five foot eleven. Now when I take, what do you mean shaking your head? <laughs> yes, I did. I was five eleven plus. <laughs> I tell you, I got no respect at all. I used to be 5'11 and a half. It said the program, right? And then I can't lie, although I did about the weight thing there, but that's another story. But I ain't 5'11 anymore. Not even with boot heels. It's all going away, isn't it? Yeah. We're talking here this just this morning, these the most energetic people around. Yeah, you know, I made my casserole yesterday. And it took all day. Uh, first I had to peel and chop the carrots. So I did that and then I took a rest. And then, and again, the macaroni ready. So, you know, I got the water boiling and I got the macaroni uh, Time for a break. And the things that you used to do just while you weren't even thinking, you just can't do anymore. That's the world we live in. That's the, that's the situation. So Jesus says what? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and rust 
Don't corrupt with people can't dig through the side of your house and steal it. Lay up for yourselves that treasure chest in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be also. Once again, Jesus speaks from the heart, about the heart, all the time. Real religion. Not systematic religion where you learn a bunch of rules, you learn a bunch of regulations, where when I was a kid, the nun stood by with a long hat pin to make sure you did the things the way you were supposed to do them. And that's religion. Or back in the day down here, right, where, you know, in the Protestant world, uh, everybody was on the brittle edge of hell. And you were being held up by the uh, spider's web and dropping into hell. Who would want that? Who would want to live that life? That's satanic. That's what the devil does. The devil <coughs> brings torture. The devil brings torment. The devil calls you to impossible things or exhausting things that call you to do something only to have to do it more and worse and better and everything else. And what does Jesus say? Come unto me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For what does he say? The one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who has all power in heaven and earth. The one who speaks and the universe comes into being. The one who sustains all things by the word of his power. What does he say? Come unto me and learn of me. Why? He uses the word meek. Because I am meek. I'm gentle. He says, I'm lowly of heart. Jesus, God, is humble. That's unthinkable. God, who created everything, who sits on the throne of all eternity, who can do whatever he wants, who can speak new creations into being, but he looks down at us, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lord, Dad, they're lost in their sin. And it's distorted their thinking. They have a continual error message that every time they reboot, the same error message comes up because there's a corruption within. And there's only one solution. That's what humility means, okay? To humble yourself. The two words, arrogate, to lift yourself up. Humble, lower yourself. Jesus sitting on his throne in heaven says, I will leave that throne, leave all my prerogatives, come down to this earth, and surrender myself to die on the cross, that whosoever will should not perish, but should have everlasting life. No, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where they never ever pass away. And then what does he say? I love this. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Your eye is the light of your body. What does he mean by that? The eye is the light of your body. Charlie Daniels had a song called Trudy, right? Call up Trudy on the telephone. Send her a letter in the mail. Tell her I'm hung up and jealous. I'm sitting here in this jail. And he talks about a guy named uh, Johnny Lee Walker was a car mechanic. He had a hand for trouble and an eye for cash. He had an eye for cash. If there's money to be found around somewhere, He's got an eye for it. He's going to find it. He's going to locate it. Because he has an eye for it. Some people have an eye for beautiful artwork. And they can spot something that has proportion and texture and delicacy and tremendous skill went into doing it. And they can tell, what do they say, a fugazi 
from something that's genuine, something that's real, something that's to be treasured. They have an eye for it. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. He's talking about your attitude. He's talking about the power of your attitude. You know what an attitude is? The attitude, in one definition, is the way the plane is oriented toward the air it's cutting through. And if the attitude of the plane is leaning forward down, where's the plane going to go? It's going to go down. It's going to nose dive. Just like if you're running on the ground and all of a sudden, you know, you, you get into the, you, you run into water, it pulls you down. But if the attitude of the plane is up, it's going to get higher and higher. That's what an attitude does. It decides where you're going to end up. It decides where you're going to go. That's why the I, your attitude, is so important. If you have a negative attitude, if you have an eye for negativity, if you have an eye, as Jesus is going to say, judge not that you be not judged. For the, with the judgment you pronounce, you'll be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. What does he say? Why do you see, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? Why do you see with your eye the speck that's in his eye, but you're not aware of that beam that's in your eye, of that large log? You know, I was just talking, to, it's interesting, I had a funeral, two funerals in the last couple of days. Well, one of them was a gravesite. It was the Bomber family. They used to come here. I baptized Candace Marie Bomber. And at the funeral yesterday, the Bombers were there. And they says, yeah, we used to go to your church. They had moved away. Now they moved back in the area, not near here. But she said, we were going to the church when you were meeting in the basement because the ceiling had collapsed. You remember that? There's four great big wooden beams. And they're back in the days when a two by four was really a two and a half by a four and a half, not a three and a half by a one and a half. And these beams, I don't know what their dimensions are, but I mean, they're a major league logs that have been squared away. And they're up in the rafters. There's four of them. And we were here in church one Sunday, and it was 10.30, and Sue had just sang. Remember that? And I said, you know what? And it was great. I said, you know what? Uh, we don't even need a sermon today. That song Sue sang is satisfactory. We might as well go home. Not five minutes later. And you can hear it on the, on the we used to record the service on cassette tape. You can hear Audrey in the back saying, it's going across the whole church because the crack started up here in the ceiling and it started going across the church. Yeah, and they came and they, well, we sent everybody home. I thought, okay, I guess we're done for the day. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sue, you brought the house down. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my sermon. It was Sue's song. And so anyways, the architects came and what did they find? They looked at those beams and they found one of those big beams just from the expansion and contraction, loading the wind over 100 years, loading the roof with snow and unloading the snow. One of those beams had finally just cracked and it was broken off completely. Not, e not even connected. And the other one was so fractured you could stick your hand in it. And so the architects came and they looked at those great big beams and they said, we're going to have to jack the whole thing up. They jacked from the basement up to this floor and from this floor up there. Jacked the beams back in place and they put big steel plates on those beams and bolted them back together. Jesus said, how come you can, how come you can see a piece of sawdust in somebody else's eye? How, how powerful and familiar is that really? Isn't it real easy to see other people's shortcomings? Isn't it real easy to see in other people things that are so annoying? And you wanna hear the inside secret? 
a lot of times the thing most annoying in that person that just gets under your skin, you have the same characteristic, but you see it in them, and you instinctively re don't like it because it's a part of you, because that's you. You've seen yourself in the mirror, but it doesn't look attractive. And so we see other people, and it's real easy to judge that moat in their eye and not even be aware of that big beam that's in ours. It's our attitude, it's our judgment, it's the way we assess things. How about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? The day you eat of that, your eyes will be opened. And all of a sudden, your eyes aren't just going to see innocence like you do now. But your eyes will be aware of good and evil. And once that happens, you'll die, is what he says. Our only hope is the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. It brings not only forgiveness, but it brings cleansing. And brings not only forgiveness and cleansing, but it brings rehabilitation. That you realize that thing I see in that other eye, it must be in my eye too, or I wouldn't be so aware of it. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same soup. We all need the self, same salvation. And in Christ Jesus is available for whosoever will. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. Lord, set us free from ourselves and embrace us as our, our Lord and Savior. Would you continue to be patient with us? Would you continue to help us? Would you continue to correct our vision so that our sight, our values, our priorities become aligned with yours. That can't happen without the Spirit of God. That can't happen without a spirit of forgiveness. That can't happen without a spirit of mercy. That can't happen without a loving relationship with you. We don't know everything about you. We see through a glass darkly. We know you love us. And we love you. And we ask you to help us. And your response is, that's great. That's what I want. Now here's how you perfect that love. You love the people that are sitting around you. Love the people that think differently than you. Love the people that look differently from you. Love the people that you're suspicious of and you don't trust. Learn to love them. You don't have to partner with them. You don't have to throw in with their plots and plans. But you need to learn to love the people that are around you. Or you'll never see the kingdom of God. And you'll never grow in grace. Would you speak to us about these things in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, folks. Here's what let's do. Let's turn in our hymnals to 463.
Let's close with a word of prayer, and I will say grace. And we can go downstairs, and again, feel free. You don't have to have brought anything. Please come down and join us. Uh, but certainly, we understand if you need to come home too. Lord, thank you so much for this day and the blessings of it. Thank you for bringing us your holy word through the very lips of Jesus down here in this world that we might hear on terms we might understand and understand how great you are, how loving and merciful you are, and how available your kingdom is. Our Heavenly Father, would you speak to us about all these things? And our Heavenly Father, we also thank you for those who prepared the food we enjoy downstairs. We pray that these things might be useful for bringing strength, health, and great fellowship. And we'll walk, excuse me, walk together with you here in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.